In the past, we had some pretty hacky CSS solutions, and you know, it was just clumsy sometimes, the, the way we had to do things. Luckily though, we now have the has pseudo class, which takes away that clumsiness of some of our previous solutions that we've had, and it also takes things that we used to need JavaScript for and now makes them possible with CSS only. We're gonna see how we can do things like theming, and even how we can select an element based on how many children it has, uh, and a few other things as well. Hello my front end friends and welcome back for yet another video. If you're new here, my name is Kevin and here at my channel I help you fall madly deeply in love with CSS and hopefully the has pseudo class is able to get you there if you're not already in love with it. So let's dive right into it. I have an example here. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's going to show us some of the different stuff that we can do. And as we're getting into this, just really quickly, I'm not going to deep dive how has actually works because I have another video where I looked at it from the very basics and we built up and looked at some other fun things you can actually do with it. And so if you want to watch this, see if it's worth actually learning. Uh, I'll remind you at the end about that other video that goes more in depth if you do want to check that one out. And the first First thing I want to look at is theming and you'll notice here I have a select and it has you know class of theme on there and so in here I do have my dark option I have a light option and a rainbow option right there in my select and what I want to be able to do is choose a theme and or let the user choose a theme and uh, if we had like a checkbox ways of doing it in the past um, that could sort of work it was a little bit weird how we had to do it but it was definitely doable um, but now we have much better ways of being able to do it thanks to the has selector. So I've created two different color themes here. So this is going to be my light theme um, that I've set up where I just basically inverted the colors. And so if I just do root like that, it's going to switch my color theme over to the light one. Um, so I'm just redefining my custom properties that I'm using lower down and then it's switching the color theme. But I only want to do this if somebody has selected the option of light from the drop down menu here. So to be able to do that, we can use the has. So I'm going to say root has. Let's just move this up a little bit. So uh, root has. And then what do we want? Well, I want my theme because we have our theme uh, so select menu right there. So it has the class of theme. And the theme has the option that is picked of value equals light. So we can just write that here. Value is equal to light. Um, the issue with it now is it's always going to take it no matter what I'm on because we have the value of light here. I only want to do it if that is selected and we can do that with the checked even though it is a select menu. We can use the check uh, checked like that. So if that one is checked, so if I switch to light, you can see it switches over to the light. And if I go back to dark, it's just going to the default. And then we can set that up again here. So we'll go back over it. I'm just going to copy this selector. Uh, and in this case, it is my my rainbow option <laughs> that I have. So here we have the value is rainbow. So if the value is rainbow and it, that value is checked, then the rainbow will get switched over and we get this rainbow theme going on right here. Um, really ugly. So we'll switch back to dark and you can even improve this with uh, like using local storage to save the person's option on their computer. So the next time they come and visit, it could actually be set up um, to the correct theme for them. So you could use JavaScript in this case to enhance the experience a little bit, but set everything up just with CSS to have the functionality there, which is, I think, the way things generally should be uh, when when it's possible. All right, now for this next one is, I'm sure you've seen modals uh, that pop up and I've looked at this in previous videos as well, how we can use, this is just a dialogue element uh, creating a modal. And one thing that's annoying with it though is even when the modal's open to like the scrolling in the background, and this is, I mean, I'm doing it with the modal and the dialogue here, even if you're doing it with a custom solution, it's, it's always annoying to try and disable scrolling in the background. Now we can do it super easily. It's amazing. Um, and I'm just going to say HTML has, and in this case, I can use modal because of the way modal works. I've explored that uh, not long ago. So if you want more information on it, you can check that out. But if you, this is just saying if I have a modal open using the dialogue element, um, I can say here that the HTML has an overflow of hidden. And by doing that, when I open my modal, the background, we have no more scrolling and then I can close it and I can open it. Now there is a slight layout shift because the scroll bar is disappearing. Uh, there's sort of ways of working with that with the scroll bar gutter thing that we have now, but that has some drawbacks to it as well. Worst case, you could add a little bit of padding on the side. So padding, um, so padding, I'm gonna say inline end, which is the same as the right side. And I think it's eight pixels, the default um, for the scroll bar. Is it 16? I don't remember. 
that didn't seem to work. Let's try 16. And there we go. So now there's just like padding that's coming in and replacing it. So the layout doesn't actually jump at all. So yeah, there's an, an interesting little one. Again, this could be padding right, but this is the logical property right there. The next one that I want to look at is actually in my modal. I have a little form here and I have looked at this in a little bit more detail in another video, uh, but we're going to sort of break it down a little bit on a simpler level in this one where I have my form groups here. So I have a form group there and a form group here. So you come in and you start writing your name and then you come in and I don't even have a button to submit, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that my form group has, uh, we're going to start with valid and we're going we're gonna to change this in a second, but this just means it has a valid entry. Whatever is in here is meeting the requirements for that element. So one's an email, one's a text, uh, right? Text there, email there. So when it has a valid uh, thing filled out in it, let's just put in a, for now, we'll add an outline of three pixels solid green. We're going to improve this in a second. We'll do lime actually. So it's actually looking at whether or not the stuff in there is valid and it's adding that border all the way around or that outline all the way around. And then so in the email, if I come in and this is invalid until I do the at and add more text, it disappears. And the only annoying thing right now is if there's nothing in there, it's considered valid, which is always a little bit frustrating. So we can actually fix this a little bit by adding in the not here. So not place, look at all these pseudo classes we're doing here, place holder shown valid. And so now we're saying that the form group has an element that is not showing a placeholder that has valid text. So I have my placeholders in there. So if I as soon as you know, this is a text field. So as soon as there's anything, it's considered valid. But if I come here, it's only once I pass that certain point, there's ways of improving this with the pattern attribute where you actually have to like have a dot com or whatever or dot co or dot anything. So it doesn't show valid right away. Now you wouldn't want to show an outline like that, but maybe instead of that, this is where the has selector is also really cool because you don't have to select the form group. I'm saying the form group has this, but then I can go back into the form group and select a different element. So then I could say the label. Um, so my label gets a color of, let's say forest green. So now if I come and I change, you can see once it gets valid, the label that I have on there actually updates and changes. And there's obviously a lot more that you can do with it than just that test at test.com. And you can see now it's saying that's valid and you could look for invalid things as well. So it's changing it to a different color, whatever you want. You're let you know, explore, have fun with this one because it's really, really cool. Next, we're going to look at how we can actually count children. And so here you can see that I have this um, display set up with this. And I've already set this one up and we're just going to break it down because writing it all out would take a little bit of time. But I have this grid and actually let's go look at my grid columns. So I have grid columns and here I have two children and then I have grid columns and I have three children. Here I have grid columns four, so on and so forth, five and six. Um, and so what we want to do here, what we can do here is I'm going to I have my grid template column set up to call count one. So the default is one if it we don't meet any of these requirements that we're going to set up. And then I have one FR just this is just the best way to sort of set things up like that. So we get even columns. Then we can actually do if my if my div has two children and the way we can say that if grid columns has two children, so has nth child two, and then we're using the is pseudo class as well, because we're saying that the nth child is also the last child. So the only time this condition is ever met is if that last child and let's just add in here. Uh, we're going to copy this just really fast, paste that in and we could select that last child, last child and give that a, we'll, we'll do a color. Um, color is red, just so we can see that it's selecting this one and it's not selecting any of these other ones. So it's only selecting it if the last child is the second child. And in that case, we get a column count of two. Now we can do the same type of thing where the column count can be, be divided by three. So any multiple of three. And that's, we do it the same way, but instead of doing three, where this would only select it if it is three children, we can do three N. So that means three N, so it's every third child. So it would be third, the sixth, the ninth, as long as the third, the sixth, the ninth are the last child, then this is valid. And again, we could come in with something. Let's just copy that again, just so we can highlight what's happening and do last child. And we can change the color here. Color will be pink just so it's a little bit different from that first one. So it will get this one. 
but then it will also do it where I have that six columns here. Where I have six columns, it's still making it three columns, and you can see it's selecting that last one. Uh, so then we can do it by four, exactly the same way, by five, exactly the same way. But the annoying thing with five, and I'm sure you've got there, and Flexbox, in all honesty, might be a better solution for this. But if ever you have five columns, or just leaving it like this might be better. But this is, let's add a border here, um, just so we can highlight what we're actually working on. Um, so it's this one. So we can say, I'm going to use an outline just so there's no layout shift. Uh, outline, three pixels, solid lime. And so we're selecting this div here, and we're saying it has a column count of two. And I always, always get asked about if I'm using grid, how can I get this last one to span across the bottom? Now, you'd have to be very specific in different use cases, and this is where maybe flex is actually a better solution than grid. If you want that type of behavior with flex wrap, it's probably a little bit easier to set things up properly. But if ever you need to do it, we can do it. <laughs> where what we're doing is the same selector we were using here to like change the color, we're selecting that last child that's here, and we're doing direct. So if you have nested children, you're not selecting um, nested things. And of course, this was commented out. Um, so you're selecting that last child and then you're telling it to span across the rest of the grid. So different things you can do with this. You can get really creative with the ways that you're working. And I, just, I think that's really, really um, an, an interesting use case. I don't know specifically how I would use this yet, uh, but the fact that we can do it is really, really cool. And if you are using nth child and things like that, you can also use negative ends to actually select, like you can do nth child to this, to this, and select ranges of content as well which is just, you know, opens up a lot of possibilities for potentially different ways of treating elements based on how many children they have, which is really, really interesting. And now this last one's a little bit in the same idea where we can have like a carousel type thing, but one of the annoying things, and let's set this up really fast. You can see I've set up my carousel and my carousel image here. And now I'm just gonna do really fast. We're gonna say a carousel. In a way we can do like an if else statement by using has, and it's not quite there. And whether you wanna do it like that or just overwrite the default, I don't know what's better. And I think there's if else is sort of coming, but I just wanna explore this idea of a way that we can do this. Um, so let's say we have the carousel and I'm gonna say that this, and this actually maybe is a more practical use case of counting children than what we saw above. So my carousel, or we already have our display of grid on there. So I'm gonna say that the grid, and we're, we're gonna fix this selector, we're gonna do more with it, but grid template columns is going to be a auto fit. So repeat auto fit, and then we can say that it's a min max of 100 pixels, one FR. And that gives us this. The issue is here where I only have three images, that's perfectly fine. But here I have a whole bunch of images. And when I have more than a certain amount of images, ideally I could, you know, it, it actually becomes scrolling, um, like horizontally scrolling, sort of like the Netflix carousel type of thing. And so what we can do for that is we could actually say here, this is carousel has, and we're doing the auto fits. So uh, it's always, I get this backwards. We're gonna start with not. So not has. Uh, so if it does not have, right, does not have, and we're going to say nth child of five. So in the situation where it does not have five children, so one, two, three, or four, we're going to use this auto fit. And the advantage with that is then I have this set up already. If you have three images, it's fine. If you have four images, then it's just going to adapt and four images are going to fit in there. If we go back down, so now I have four images, there's no scrolling, but because we're using auto fit, it's just adjusting. Or if we brought that down to two images, uh, the two images are also going to work and they just fill up the space. So already that's a pretty good start. But as we saw, if we have more images than that, uh, they sort of start getting really tiny and ideally then we do something different. So that's sort of my <laughs> if, or maybe that's the else, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but <laughs> then we can do the opposite, carousel. And then in this case, just has nth child five. So if it has five children, and if it has five children, it could be five or more. You don't have to specify that because it just is what it is. And in this case, we're gonna do something completely different. So we're gonna say grid auto flow is actually going to be column. So everything automatically becomes a column and they squish all the way down. But then we could also say that the grid auto columns are say 20%. And what that's gonna do is that, and then we get some overflow. So then we can say that the overflow X is scroll, and we can give it a little bit of um, padding block, 
which let's just say to RAM padding block is a logical property top and bottom. And then we get this. So if we have less than five, they just sort of work their way out. If we have more than five, then we get a side scrolling like that. So yeah, I guess it's sort of similar, but I like this idea of like either this or this. Um, again, this could be the default behavior and then we just overwrite it with that. So, um, but yeah, I think that's a fun use case for that as well. And there were a lot of things I covered in this video. And so I've put a playlist of videos together that explore some of the things that I talked about in here in passing. So that is right here. And if you'd like a more in-depth breakdown on how has worked, I have a video right here that you can also check out. And with that, I'd like to say a very big thank you to my enablers of awesome, Jan, Johnny, Mr. Dave, Patrick, Simon, Steven, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.